There is a story, still current in Turkey, about an Ottoman Sultan who had a penchant for languages. Desirous of learning a challenging language and having heard that the nearby Caucasus harboured speakers of difficult tongues, he sent one of his youngest and brightest scholars to the mountains to learn one of these languages so that he might return and teach it in turn to the Sultan. The young man set out upon his task filled with confidence. A year passed and the young man returned to the court. When he came into the Sultan's presence, the Sultan asked him to speak out and tell him what the languages were like. Silently, the scholar drew from beneath his cloak a small bag full of pebbles, held it up and rattled it at the Sultan. This, O Caliph, he replied, is what the languages are like. These are the words which open John Colarusso's 1988 phonological survey on the Northwest Caucasian languages. It is a fabulously well-researched and pioneering study on a language group which is famous for its notoriously complicated consonant system. For example, the Ubik language has 81 consonants but is paired with a relatively simple vowel system. There's just two of them. If you're looking to upskill your knowledge on the Northwest Caucasian languages, you're likely to encounter this phonological survey alongside the work of Colorusso in general. Now, a wise subscriber to the channel suggested that I check out Colorusso's proto-pontic hypothesis, which can be found in the following paper. This work presents evidence of a potential relationship between Indo-European and Northwest Caucasian, specifically that they at some point formed a proto-language termed Proto-Pontic. Now I know what you might be thinking, oh no, not another language family supposedly linked to Indo-European, but bear with me because this one I think gets a little bit interesting in my opinion. So to begin with the Proto-Pontic hypothesis. Well, as always, I recommend that viewers just go and check out Colorusso's paper on Proto-Pontic and make your own opinion on it. But for those who want the lowdown from me, it's about 30 pages long, so considerably smaller than other works we have discussed which attempt to link language families to Indo-European. But Colorusso has subsequently added material to his hypothesis and there's even a kind of prequel which we can see on screen now. Summing up Colorusso's work, however, he demonstrates parallels between the phonological systems of Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Northwest Caucasian. Of particular interest here is Colorusso's reconstruction of very early, what he terms, pre-Indo-European gutturals, which gives us a very Caucasian looking system. Colorusso also covered several grammatical elements common to both language families, alongside lexical correspondences. Colorusso gives a time depth of about 7,000 to 9,000 years BC, and a homeland which could be either just south of the Caucasus, in eastern Anatolia, or just north of them. In the conclusion to the paper, Colorusso states his preference for a homeland to the northwest of the Caucasus. Here, on screen now, is the phonological system of Proto-Pontic. Pretty complicated, right? Now, it would be impossible to cover the entirety of Colorusso's work on the sound systems of Proto-Northwest Caucasian, Proto-Indo-European, and subsequently Proto-Pontic. It's best to simply get yourself a strong cup of coffee and go through the source material yourself. Ultimately, however, Colorusso is arguing for a Caucasian aerial zone where glottalic systems were the standard and that Indo-European, once it began its migration out of this area, successively simplified this complicated inventory into a something more traditional looking model. Moving on, 
Colorosso finds evidence for correspondences between Proto-Indo-European case endings and Proto-Northwest Caucasian. Here is an overview, including the M accusative, which you might well remember from our discussion on Indo-Uralic. Personal pronoun correspondences are also presented. And other comparisons, some examples we can see on screen now, from preverbs to particles, feminines, collectives, and cognates. And here we can find a few more selected examples. The numbering is as you can find it in Colorusso's original article. I've also kept the format as you can find it in the text with only minimal changes on my part. Of course, you can find more examples in excess of 65 and a lot more detail in the original work, so please do consult it. Also, there are more examples presented in Colorusso's follow-up paper, but because all of the examples are kind of interrelated to each other and there's context provided, I've not put them here. And it's not strictly connected to the proto-pontic hypothesis, but this work is well worth checking out. It reviews Colorusso's work and also looks at some of the examples of correspondences that Colorusso provides. There's a little bit of a range of parallels, which contrasts with Blevins's book on Proto-Indo-European Euskarian, which relied heavily on comparing just Proto-Basque reconstructed forms to Proto-Indo-European. Although I have to say, Blevins's work was easier to follow and better referenced than Colorusso's. Not being an expert on Northwest Caucasian, it took me considerable and I mean considerable effort to verify some of the forms Colorusso was putting forward. The forms, however, that were put forward looked reasonable according to Colorusso's data, but as is often found in similar works like this, some of the comparisons feel tortured, to borrow a term from one commentator on Colorusso's work. Later, in 2019, Colorusso added an interesting perspective to his hypothesis by noting a song in Latvian myth about the sun's daughter, a goddess, who had wandered into the sea to the point where only her crown could be seen. Colorusso equates this to the dawn and that the Proto-Indo-European speaking community, or its ancestor, must have been situated in a position where to see the dawn emerge over water. The only plausible location where this could occur, according to Colorusso, is north of the Caucasus, where the dawn would have been over the Caspian Sea, and actually the sunset to the west, over the Black Sea. Let's take a closer look, shall we? Two candles burned at sea, in silver candelabra, Sons of Dievs lit them, waiting for Saula's daughter. Saula's daughter waded in the sea. They saw only her crown. Row the boat, sons of Dievs, save Saula's soul. Sons of Dievs built a barn, fixing rafters of gold. Saula's daughter walked through, trembling like a leaf. Colorusso, 2019, notes that it was the great linguist Eric Hamp who first put to him the idea that Proto-Northwest Caucasian may be linked to Proto-Indo-European. Hamp was an Indo-Europeanist of solid reputation, even featuring on a set of Albanian postage stamps 
commemorating linguists who had made a significant impact to the field of Albanian studies. Outside of Indo-European, however, Hamp was known as a bit of a lumper. Few linguists have ever put their weight behind Proto-Pontic or the broader idea that Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Northwest Caucasian are somehow related. Hamp was one of the few who seemed to support it. No great surprise there then, as it was at least partly his idea. When Colorosso published his Proto-Pontic Hypothesis, reviews were mixed to say the least. Ruchlen and Bengston, featuring in the same journal that published a reprint of Colorosso's original hypothesis at the request of editor Alan Bomhard, are highly critical. Ruchlen doesn't doubt that Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Northwest Caucasian are related. He just doubts that they descend from the same Proto-language. What he means here is that he doubts the relationship is close. In fact, he's quite funny about his criticism to Proto-Pontic. It even managed to make me laugh out loud. And it has to be said, that is a quite rare thing for a linguistics article. Ruchlin's main criticism is that many of the comparisons noted by Colorusso are actually observable outside of Proto-Pontic. It's similar to the other criticisms I've covered concerning the Indo-Uralic hypothesis. Many of the observations actually form part of Greenberg's Eurasiatic. So whilst there might be evidence of some distant relationship, it doesn't actually show that they're particularly closely related at all. Bengston mirrors the criticism of Ruchlen, although both of them make the same slightly unfair observation that there already exists a body of evidence linking West and East Caucasian language families genetically as if this somehow rules out the possibility of Proto-Pontic. In fairness to Colorusso, he does address this in his article and he isn't opposed to a widening of Proto-Pontic to include these language groups. Both authors criticise the strength of cognates identified by Colorusso, but again, in the original text, Colorusso himself states that he doesn't expect many strong lexical similarities to be detected due to the time depth in question. And in fact, if we're honest, it's rare to find any proposal linking a relationship between two proto-languages that doesn't have criticism concerning the strength of the cognates identified. Colorusso acknowledges that not many researchers seem to back his proposals. One linguist he named as being receptive to his theory was Alan Bomhard. Although it is crucial to know that Bomhard didn't buy into the theory wholesale. Bomhard saw many positive to Colorusso's work, but came to a different conclusion. That when early Indo-Europeans, or rather Indo-Uralic speakers, because Bomhard, like others as we have seen in my dedicated video on the matter, is a supporter of some flavour of the Indo-Uralic hypothesis, that when these speakers entered into the region around the Black Sea, they mingled extensively with Caucasian speakers. This process gave rise to the Caucasian influence, specifically in Proto-Indo-European. The other Indo-Uralic speakers away from the Black Sea region would have continued speaking their Indo-Uralic free from the Caucasian influence of their southern neighbours and eventually this gave rise to the Uralic branch. Bomhard would take these ideas outlined in 1994 and expand upon them in his 2019 paper on the Caucasian substrate hypothesis. Bomhard points out that Sergei Starostin had made similar observations in a 1988 Russian language paper that had gone somewhat overlooked at the time. Bomhard's version of the Caucasian substrate hypothesis, however, would gain significantly more attention, including published comments from the likes of Mallory, Cortland and Antony. 
pretty big names in the field of Indo-European studies. So that's about it for me for part one of this brief introduction on the Proto-Pontic Hypothesis. What I will say about Colorosso's work is that it's a small but dedicated body of work on a specific idea that over a series of articles attempts to bring together the grammar and the phonology of the proto-languages. And he also attempts to throw into the mix things like archaeology, the study of myth, genetics, all good stuff like that, but admittedly at a very shallow level. It's not like Blevins's work, for example, which jumps headfirst into one idea, that being the comparison of reconstructed proto-forms, and really just sticks at that and focuses on that. Colorusso attempts to cover all bases, and he does so. And in doing so, he's created a really nice base for further researchers to build upon his ideas. And that's kind of what people did, although perhaps not in the way that Colorusso expected. Because the most interesting result of Colorusso's work, for me, is how it kind of gave birth to the Caucasian substrate hypothesis, which has gathered a lot more attention from researchers in the community. And it's actually a hypothesis which links very well to another idea that we spoke about on this channel, the Indo-Uralic hypothesis. All very interesting stuff. So hang around here for a continuation of this video where we're going to take a deeper look into these ideas. But that's going to be all from me for today. It's been truly an honour to have this opportunity to speak to you about something interesting like the Proto-Pontic hypothesis. As always, you've been fantastic. I've been Learn Hittite. I'll be back very soon with hopefully another very interesting video. Goodbye for now.